please welcome Jonathan Hertzberg of Fun City Editions and Heartbreakers writer-director Bobby Rod. Thank you so much. And I, I, I know that some of the actors are with us tonight. And I know Henry Sanders, Max Gale, Jamie Rose. And is there anybody I'm leave, leaving out that I just see? Why don't you stand up? Yeah, yeah, you guys, yeah. yeah please. We, we made this movie 38 years ago, and uh, that print has not been screened in 30 years. It, it held up pretty good. Please, thank you. That looked like it hadn't been through a projector. It has. It's been, in, it's been in my closet for a very long time. It must be a good climate control closet. Yeah, it's with the wine. <laughs> yeah. so, um, it, it struck me that, the, that this screening is a little like. Um, like blue show at the end, how everyone comes out for blue, and here, you know, tonight you have quite a nice turnout here for, for you. Which thank, thank you guys so much. Yeah. To, speaks to, to to your your career. You worked with a lot of the the you know the same people over and over in your films. It speaks it speaks to uh, you know the relationships that you forged over how many years? Now? Uh, long time. <laughs> More than 40. So, so you told me when we talked a few months ago uh, for the Blu-ray that, that there are a lot of uh, pieces of your life in this movie. Do you, do you think you could tell us a little bit yeah, about well, the I mean, big ones? Uh, I made this movie after I had uh, a very big setback. I made a movie, uh, the first movie I was hired on was somewhat of a disaster. Uh, uh, I worked for an actor who became a producer named Anthony Quinn, and he managed to torture me for two years, and we made, we made a movie that, uh, um, it wasn't, it's not easy to get Hollywood people to walk out of the screening in the middle, but we did it. And uh, I didn't know if I'd ever work again, and I, I wrote this movie uh, just a uh, uh, personal place. Um, people have asked me which character am I, and I'm really part of each of them. Uh, and uh, we had an interesting casting process. I, all these actors, uh, from Kevin Klein, Jeff Bridges, uh, John Hurd, Peter Rieger, Peter Weller, uh, I talked to all these people, and a lot of people uh, liked the script, but they were afraid to do it. In fact, Mandy Patinkin was supposed to do it, and I flew all, we had the same age, and I flew all the way to New York, and by the time I got there, his wife had talked him out of it. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it was controversial at the time. Uh, we got an X rating originally, as you might know, and, uh, uh, and Really, this is the movie that got the X rating. I mean, people think that I cut it to get the R, but I did cut it to get the R, and then I put everything back in. <laughs> uh, which you're not supposed to do, but I, I didn't know that anybody would ever see it again. It was on the rating board, so. Our Blu-ray has a little bit more in that. In that, in that I, I, can't, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> you haven't looked at it yet? No, I haven't. We have, we I wanted to see, I hadn't seen the movie in at least 25 years until tonight, so this was, and I haven't been in the cinema for a couple of years, so this was wow. really a treat for me. Wow. Well, thank you for, for you know, breaking whatever the... <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, but uh, I'm really interested if you guys have any questions, because uh, I don't, I, I mean, there are people seeing it for the first time, I think, so there's somebody right there. I just want to ask about working with uh, the director of photography, Michael Ballas, the wonderful work he did here. Illustrate first about what it was like working with him. Yeah, I, I've been really lucky. I, I've had people that I was supposed to work with pull out of projects, and the people that replaced them were always better. So that's that's very lucky. And I had a guy who I won't say his name because he's a he's still a friend who, who pulled out, and um, I had seen uh, many of the Fassbender films, and somebody uh, in New York, uh, maybe it was my AD, Jack Barron had said, there's this guy, Michael Malhaus, and I said, oh, I know him, he did the uh, Fassbender movies. And he said, you should talk to him, and I sent him the script, and remember in those days, we had this 
send a hard copy of FedEx to New York and wait. And uh, I got on the phone with Michael, and he was laughing the whole time. And we became great friends, and uh, I learned almost every good shot was an idea I had that would have been unrealized without Michael. That Michael took them and ran with it. And, uh, and I, was, I was kind of, uh, I, I was just a fan in the audience tonight watching his work. He was a great guy, we went out to do another movie. I was lucky, he was supposed to work with Scorsese on Last Temptation of Christ, and he kept losing his money, so I kept making movies with Michael. And I got to do the next one too, Baha Oklahoma, and, and, his, and his sons, and uh, you guys probably know his son Florian went on to be a, a big DP himself, and, uh, and Sebastian's first AD. It just, it just was a great family, and they were always great to me. Was this his first time in LA? Like, this was uh, this was Michael's first time in LA, and uh, he had only done uh, Baby It's You, I think, in America at that time, the John Sayles movie. Uh, we went on to, I mean, if you guys don't know him, you should, you would know him. He shot Goodfellas, Color of Money. He, shot, he shot a movie with your wife as well. He shot a movie with my wife. Reckless. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't remember that. Is that true, Pam? Yes, it is. <laughs> my wife is here, Pam Springsteen. But that speaks to uh, something about the, there's there's like there's like a tradition of like outside like people from the outside like John Schlesinger shooting Midnight Cowboy and Michael Ballhouse coming from from Europe and but yet somehow they capture and I'm not an Angelino but they they really seem to they he you guys really have something unique here it really feels like an insider's view but then at the same time you know yeah, no, my, my first two movies were shot by Alfonso Beato who's Brazilian and it's the same thing that they they had a different way of looking at Los Angeles and they made me appreciate Los Angeles um, and uh, and Michael Mike Michael was a DP who was very much about actors his mom had run a, an acting troupe in Germany and he sat through all of the we, we rehearsed for weeks uh, with Nick and, and Peter and Michael came to all the rehearsals and we would drive to the set every day together, and he would only talk about acting. We never talked about camera. He, was, he really felt that the acting was good, and I believe this to this day. But the camera, he would figure that out. Do you have any other questions for the crowd? Right. Yeah. First, I want to thank you for making a movie. I'm kind of outraged that I hadn't seen it before because it's, it's, uh, it really moved me tremendously. No, Perhaps. I'm outraged. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's on a right, but okay. No, well, I was curious about that as well, but I figured yeah, I, you might get into that. But uh, and also, Jonathan, I wanted to thank you for bringing uh, awareness to this. It's had a beta tape, and I never got around to transfer it because that I never heard about because of the Tangerine Dream score. But now I get to see it in the best way possible, and it's you here. And uh, so it's nice to be able to thank you. I think uh, the question I want to ask, uh, well, for, uh, I think, is this the first on record use of the word hangry? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, um, I don't know where that came from. I think, I think, uh, I, I know I wrote it, but, you know, it's, you have to go back a long way to remember what, you know, 40 years back when you were writing. Um, but I'll tell you that Carol Lohr, I was just marveling at her a little bit because I haven't seen her in years. Um, the producer, uh, Australian guy named Bob Weiss, they sent me, we, we had like enough money to make the movie, so it was not, I would never cry poor on this movie, but we had just enough. So they sent me, they wanted me to hire a French actress that had some uh, reputation in the United States. And so they sent me to Paris, but with nobody else, no assistant, nobody. And they put me in a hotel room with a camera. And I had to run the camera and act with the actresses. And they were, it was the who's who of Paris. It was Isabel Huppert, Valerie Kaprisky, Miu Miu, uh, Nadine Tritino. They, they were all people that I kind of admired. And I can't act. Was, so if you can survive, as Carol did, uh, uh, a session with me, you got to play the role. They all, they all wanted to come and work in the United States. So we had can we see those tapes? Uh, I, I probably have them somewhere. I don't know if I have anything I can play it on, though. It was a very welcoming situation, France alone. 
Yeah, when no, you bury and, your pumpkin child. And, uh, and I did it alone every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Michael. Um, so Duke's Cafe or Duke's Diner, where they meet throughout the film, what neighborhood was that? Was that a real restaurant? That, that, where it, it, it was a real restaurant, but that wasn't it. It, it. it used to be across from a place called the Sports Connection, which we used for the, um, the aerobic scenes. And it was there was a place called Sandy Koufax's Tropicana Motel. And the movie is very much my, my neighborhood. I used to go to that gym, and then I would go to Duke's. And Duke's was kind of a rock and roll scene. The Doors would go there. Uh, I, I met Sam Shepard there. I mean, it was it was just you didn't, and everybody just sat with everybody, and it was uh, it was a great it was a great time. And I tried to recreate it as best I could. That was downtown. Um, but most of where things were, the gallery was based on G. Ray Hawkins' gallery on Melrose. Uh, it was a photographic gallery, it's still a photographic gallery. Um, and we just redid it to be a painting gallery. And, but most of it, you know, the, the lofts were downtown. Uh, it was my, uh, I grew up in LA, I live a block from here, and I was born a block from here. So, uh, I stay close to Somebody in the back there. Speak to a That final shot of the Alameda, you pull up the sky. It's the really core effect. It is. It is. That's where the place that we. Had, but we brought the Grohmans a mortuary bench. Yeah. Yeah. It was somehow meaningful. Yeah. I wanted to congratulate you on the film, of course, but also I, the workout scene reminded me of Perfect, but then I thought, wait, this film predates Perfect yeah. by a year. Um, and then also I really like the use of Etta James and Pat Benatar, and I'm curious, with a film like this, which was probably low budget, and with Orion, at what point in the production did you choose the music, and was that a struggle to get the rights to those songs and use them in your film? Uh, thank you for bringing that up, because... I was very lucky. Uh, the Eddie James stuff was, um, I, I was I was very lucky. I lived on a hill, and my friend Barbara Williams, who was married to Nick shortly thereafter, lived on the corner. Um, uh, Pam lived next door, married to somebody else. I was married to somebody else. Um, across the street, there was this woman who had a little room, who rented a room to her nephew. And he was a very young guitarist who was completely unknown. But I didn't have the money, and I needed two more songs, so I, I asked him if he would take a shot, and I didn't know he worked with Etta James. So he and Etta, Brian Ray is his name, he's only now played 25 years with uh, Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people just get discovered. It's fantastic. You know, uh, you're just lucky if you meet him along the way. And uh, Brian wrote those songs with Etta and, and recorded them, and they replaced, I had much more expensive songs that I, I couldn't buy, and, uh, but they wouldn't have been any better. I mean, uh, I, I loved the work he did. And then, you know, you just, you know, uh, my friend Michael Mann had done Thief with Tangerine Dream and introduced me to Edgar. And I went on, I've now done over 20 projects with Christoph Franke, who was one of the original you, you, you probably worked with Tangerine Dream or members of Tangerine Dream more than any other. Oh, nobody's even close. Nobody's close. <laughs> <laughs> but because they, first of all, they, they were great. Edgar, unfortunately, had passed on. I worked mostly with Christoph. But the last movie that I did two years ago, I worked with Paul Haslinger, who, saw, who joined the band later. I mean, they just, they get me, and they've been great to me. Did, did, did you go out, did, did you go to Germany? So, yeah, the score was recorded in Berlin. Um, I did two scores with them in Berlin. Then they they uh, opened a studio in Austria, and I did several scores there. I did a movie called Dead Solid Perfect, and that they came to LA, they were touring, and I did there. And then Christoph moved to Laurel Canyon, and I think I've done 15 or 20 scores with him. And I've just been really lucky. And, and I did, I, I gotta tell this on him, I did a little movie called Jack the Dog with my own money, and he did the score for me for nothing. And this says something about who I am, it's probably not good. Um, but uh, I didn't like it. 
And I told him I didn't like it, and he did the whole score over for me, for nothing. And that's, I mean, he's just, that's the kind of person, he, he's just a great, great guy. And that's, that's the way that band worked, is that they did it until you were happy. Wow. Yeah, I, I, during the sex scene, there's a song by Nona Hendrix, which there's yeah. a queer, you know, she's a lesbian, and there's like a lot of queer tones that are obvious in the film. But I'm curious at the time, it, it felt, it feels like the most queer film I've seen, non queer films. Just because it's so authentic, the relationship between the men, it's like visceral. I've had friendships like that, so I'm just curious. No, I, I think were... that is a great compliment because there's this thing that people are talking about now called uh, presentism. You guys heard this term about evaluating the past with today's standards. And so I was very. I was very concerned if my kids saw this movie today, if they would think ill of me for the politics, the sexual politics of the movie. And, uh, but I was, I was pretty happy that people were honest with one another in the movie. And um, I think that just comes a lot from listening to actors. And the actors, you know, uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't really think much of whether James Lawrence was gay or straight, but. Uh, but everybody has seen and has seen his performance and loved it, so that makes me happy that I didn't. I wouldn't want to. Uh, yeah, to me, it lives in like a, an area that's beyond that a definition of sexual orientation. It's like an abstract, like a meeting point of like sexuality. That's just really cool. No, it's like I think that is, a, is a real compliment. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah in the back there. What inspired the Hippia uh, artist? Um, the, the painter is, is based on, uh, I had a very close friend named Robert Blue who did all the paintings. And uh, I, when I was 18, I moved out of my parents' house and I moved into this place on Larrabee Street in West Hollywood. And in the next building was this, this guy who I looked up to, he was a painter. And he was very bohemian, he was free spirit, this was 1969. And, uh, and his name was Robert Blue, and this is what he did. And that story about his dad was a famous comedian named Ben Blue. He's, I think his last movie was It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And he did a lot, of, a lot of going way back in history. And Blue told me that story about, about finding the magazines in his dad's drawer. And that kind of was one of the impetuses for the movie, the writing. You know. The other was that I actually did break down and start sobbing uh, in uh, Cafe Figaro one night when a friend of mine, who I had treated badly, uh, told me he was quitting the movie that we were doing. And uh, that was really, I had never cried as an adult, and I thought, that's interesting why men have such a difficult time with their emotions. That was the impetus for the movie. Yeah. I appreciate with the large cast, you really give all of the actors moments to shine, you know, everyone in the ensemble. I wanted to ask specifically about Carol Wayne, who I think is well, really well known for The Night Show, but I don't really know her as a film actor. Can you talk about your work with her? Yeah, um, Car Carol, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know that she ever, she never, I know that she never talked in her real voice on film before that scene when, when uh, she confronts Blue. Um, uh, I, I, I talked to her mainly to write the piece. I didn't think that she would necessarily be in the film, but I wanted to talk to somebody. I also talked to Carol Doda in, uh, if any of you guys are familiar with San Francisco, uh, the original topless movement. And, uh, and so I just kind of created the character with Carol. And then it turned out that I interviewed a bunch of people and nobody else seemed like they could play it. So it was kind of, it seemed risky at the time, but now I can't imagine anybody but her playing that character. And you got, I think, uh, Roger Ebert gave, your, gave the film four stars. And he <laughs> cited her scene as like the best, the scene where she where she talks in her real voice as the, one of the best oh, scenes that's, of the that's year. Nice, yeah. Well, Ro Roger, if you don't know this, had a whole uh, secret life uh, with Russ Meyer, too. He wrote one of Russ Meyer's films. And he was, uh, so it, it was, 
there was when I went to film school. There were two schools of film. There, I mean, there was a school where you went to college. I went to both SC and UCLA. But most of my friends went into the Corman School, which was just making low-budget movies, not getting paid but getting opportunities. And uh, and so when I uh, a scene at the end in the cafe is my whole crew. I, uh, in fact, I see Chris Medic. I see his dad there. Uh, but my whole crew was, there were no other extras, it was just my crew. And, uh, and they were just people who were a mix. Uh, most of them were from the Corman School, and they just, you know, they knew how to do it. The people in film school had all these, including me, highfalutin ideas, but we didn't uh, really know how to make movies. And so I always mixed them for my first uh, 10 years working. We have time for one more. Yeah, in the back. That woman. Yes. Yeah. What were some of the most important lessons you took away from making the film? What were some of those important lessons that you took away? Um, well, I think for me it was uh, trying to find my own voice because um, the movie I did before that it was such a disaster it was not me at all. What's it called? I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> it's got like five things. No, the problem is with Google, everybody will have it before I get to the lobby. But, um, but uh, uh, no, I mean, the movie, uh, I like it, but I like it because it's sometimes I think it's really pretentious, and sometimes I think that it's too on the nose, but it's very much me, the voice, I mean, not the characters. And, uh, and I. This was a good thing for me because I still I don't want to quit and I want to I want to do this kind of work where I get to say stuff that I think is original for me. So that's that was my best lesson because I've never really done that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. We'll be back tomorrow night. We'll have about a 10 minute break followed by Choose Me. Thank you.